Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Friday, day 316, January the 19th, 2018. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's Fun Friday. And is there anything more fun than exposing the deep state coup and watching it all collapse around them like a deck of like a house of cards? Like dominoes? No! There's nothing more fun than that. And that's why we're all here, right? Thank you so much for tuning in, especially to my new subscribers and for those of you who may be viewing the Towergate video for the first time, welcome to the community. It's good to have you. We're having a lot of fun here. We weren't having a lot of fun back about five or six months ago in the summer. Things looked pretty bleak, but now that things are going our way, it's a good time around this place. I really value the... Um, comments uh you know what makes this channel i don't have the biggest channel but i'm sure i have the best channel there is and it's because the subs that i have and the commenters that i have we have a really great community of uh people that uh watch these videos and and uh engage in various conversation with each other in the comment section and i do read all the comments and um i'm very appreciative because a, a lot of times i get tipped off to things from links that people leave or conversations that people have amongst themselves. Sometimes people pose questions to me. So uh, it's really an interactive YouTube channel. It's not where I just come out and do YouTube videos and just tell you what I think and I don't pay any attention to anything else. I actually do read the comments and uh, I actually do follow up on things. People leave links. I try to, I try to look at them all. Um, comments I think about and uh, we talk about things and they become topics. Uh, and some of the videos that I do so it's a very interactive uh, type of a YouTube channel where the commenters and the subs uh, get to kind of participate in the content that we talk about every day it tells me what you're interested in as well so uh, thank you for all that now the reason I mention that is because yesterday I did mention that we thought it was kind of interesting that we found out that Mueller Uncle Bob the executioner did interview the Rotten Reverend Clinton about the dossier. But, you know, as I said, it probably shouldn't surprise us because she actually is the one who paid for it, right? So she's the one who paid for the dossier. Shouldn't surprise us that she was interviewed by Uncle Bob. But there was something else that I was going to talk about that I, n I just never got to. Because every day I have a list of about 20 or 25 topics. I never get to them all. Never. And that was one of the things I just didn't get to. But... Thanks to the lovely and talented Mora, one of our favorite uh, commenters here in the community, um, commented on that, that uh, I didn't mention anything about the Blumenthal because it was a pretty big revelation. And it's really, I'm glad she, she dropped that uh, in the comments section because it's actually much more important than even the interview of the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Again, we can understand why Mueller would interview Clinton. She paid for the dossier. But why Sidney Blumenthal? Why Sidney Blumenthal? What's he got to do with anything? He wasn't a member of the Obama administration, nor was he allowed to be a member of the Obama administration. Maybe some of you need a little bit of background so you understand where this, where this is coming from and why this is so important that we dig into the Sidney Blumenthal aspect of this. <clears throat> Sidney Blumenthal has, uh, was, of course, uh, uh, involved in the first Clinton administration with Bill Clinton, but he's really much more an ally of uh, Hillary than he is Bill. And um, he's really, a lot of people call him Hillary Clinton's hatchet man. And during the 2008 contest for the D Democratic nomination, it was the hatchet man, Sidney Blumenthal, for Hillary Clinton, that started the birther movement. It was also Sidney Blumenthal that put out the uh, photo uh, of showing Obama in that African garb and various other things that he said and did during the campaign that uh, really ticked off the long Mac daddy, Barack Hussein Obama. He despises Sidney Blumenthal and he knows that Blumenthal is a very, very close uh, friend of the Rotten Reverend Clinton and her hatchet man. So when Hillary became Secretary of State, Obama made it perfect, perfectly clear to her that Sidney Blumenthal was not uh, allowed to be in any way, shape, or form a part of his administration, including having anything to do with the State Department that she was head of. 
So clearly, Barack Obama and Sidney Blumenthal, well, at least we, we know Obama despises Blumenthal. I don't know how Blumenthal feels about Barack Obama. It may have just been politics for him. But for Barack Obama, he took it personally, and he despises Sidney Blumenthal. Now, most of you probably remember the name Sidney Blumenthal because during the Benghazi hearings, it was that particular line of questioning that was the most riveting during those hearings, and it was uh, based on these uh, email conversations between Hillary Clinton and Sidney Blumenthal. So that's where some of you people may remember hearing Sidney Blumenthal is back from the Benghazi hearings. But then we also learned during the, uh, when WikiLeaks released the emails and then the Podesta emails, there were many, many emails that were uh, talking about Sidney Blumenthal. And we know from the some of the emails between Hillary and Blumenthal, the exchanges that occurred between Huma and Blumenthal, because he would send his stuff to to Huma and Huma would forward it to Hillary. And uh, this was not supposed to happen and this would have made uh, Barack Obama very, very unhappy to learn that Hillary Clinton was still associating with Blumenthal on State Department matters, which is what exactly what she was doing. And uh, this is kind of the backstory to Sidney Blumenthal. But it certainly is a good question to ask, why would he be questioned about the dossier what would Sidney Blumenthal have to do with the dossier? Now, Sidney Blumenthal was interviewed by the FBI about the dossier, according to Sarah Carter's sources, back in February of 2016. So, just prior to the FBI getting the FISA warrant to spy on the Trump team, Based on the dossier, the FBI talked to Sidney Blumenthal. But they weren't the least bit interested in talking to Confusion GPS, the firm that Christopher Steele was working for. Does that make any sense? Why did the FBI, prior to just prior to getting the FISA warrant, why did they go talk to Sidney Blumenthal about the dossier? but never go talk to Homer Simpson at Confusion GPS, the man who contracted Christopher Steele to put together the dossier. Blumenthal is definitely a hatchet man. He is definitely a dirty dealer and a deep swamp dweller. But what does he know and what is his involvement in the dossier? far as I know, his name hasn't popped up anywhere, but neither did Papa Galopoulos. Well, we know that the Rotten Reverend Clinton paid for the dossier, and that was going to be her ticket to defeating Trump. It was going to be the insurance policy, which would guarantee that Trump would lose, or if he won, to guarantee it could force him out of office. The only way that Sidney Blumenthal would have known anything about the dossier or would have had anything to do with the dossier is if the rotten Reverend Clinton brought him in on it. That would have been his source. Question is, because he is the hatchet man, what role did the rotten Reverend Clinton give to Sidney Blumenthal to play in the procurement of the dossier. At some point, the rotten Reverend Clinton is going to be called to testify in probably closed session. We'll probably not know about that until after it happens. But she is going to be asked if she ever discussed with Sidney Blumenthal anything about this uh, Trump Russia thing, the dossier. They're going to be asking Sidney Blumenthal a lot of questions now that his name has popped up, because believe me, these people in Washington, they know all about Sidney Blumenthal. Uh, he's, a, he's a dealer that's been around the swamp for a very long time. And everyone knows he's a very dirty, uh, dirty character. So this is a very interesting point. Thank you so much, Mara, for 
um, reminding me not to uh, skip past that because it's one of these things I might have gone on to the next day and said, well, that's just something I didn't get to. But it's very important that we stop and take a moment and consider the extraordinary um, revelation that Sidney Blumenthal was somehow mixed up in the dossier. Hmm. There are definitely a lot of questions I would have for Sidney Blumenthal and the Rotten Reverend Clinton regarding this matter. And we should also keep in mind that like Huma, Sidney Blumenthal was on the payroll of the Clinton Foundation, apparently being paid $10,000 a month doing work for the Clinton Foundation. What sort of work do you think Sidney Blumenthal was doing for the Clinton Foundation that was worth $10,000 a month? That's a pretty good change, isn't it? Do you make $10,000 a month? I don't. That's a very interesting question. Hmm. Sidney Blumenthal and Huma both drawing big salaries from the Clinton Foundation. Something tells me when they recover all those emails, and they're going to, we're going to find a lot of communication between Sidney Blumenthal and Huma. There would be information that would be passed forward to Hillary, telling Hillary what she needed to do if she wanted to see that big fat deposit into the Clinton Foundation. My friends, again, we've compared this to peeling back an onion. This is peeling back a rotten onion. And my eyes are watering every day, another layer, another layer. And every time we get through another layer and we think, okay, well, we pretty well got this thing figured out who the central players are, another layer is unpeeled and we find a couple other people come out of the woodwork. And do you know, they're all connected to the rotten Reverend Clinton. Everything leads back to the Rotten Reverend, everyone that's involved in this whole plot is connected to the Rotten Reverend Clinton. And ultimately, this, when we get to the core of this Rotten Gourd, we are going to find the fingerprints of the Rotten Reverend Clinton all over all of these crimes and these are real crimes type you go to jail for any of you have any idea what role Sidney Blumenthal may have played in this please let me know someone left a link for me to take a look at uh, what George Webb and he does some good work uh, I will take a look uh, later this evening or tomorrow morning at uh, what George Webb might be saying about that. You know, um, he's an interesting fellow. He does some good work. I'll take a look at what he's found, and I'll be digging into it myself over the weekend. But uh, we certainly need to find out uh, why Sidney Blumenthal would have any... Uh, I don't know what the word is, why he would have any thing to do with the dossier. How does he fit into that? We'll keep digging, and I'm sure at some point that layer of the onion will be revealed as well. Alrighty, let's get on to today's news. Chuck Ross of the Daily Caller. The House Intelligence Committee released today the 165-page transcript of the Glenn Homer Simpson testimony from November the 14th, and it was a unanimous vote by the Republicans on that committee. It was a total party-line vote. Not one single Democrat voted to shed a little light on what uh, had been going on, and this is all, of course, in relation. What this was, was this was uh, a memo that was put together by Devin Nunes and the investigators working for him at the House Intel Committee, which kind of gave a um, uh, an overview of the things that were done within the FISA court and the surveillance and the unmasking and all that. And so today, 
they voted, all Republicans voted to release, and all the Democrats voted against the release of the 165-page transcript. And from what we're hearing, because it hasn't been released to the public, although we expect it will be, but at this point, just from those who have viewed it, they say it's absolutely incredible. In fact, that's the very next thing we're going to get to right here. But it is interesting that not one single Democrat wanted that to be released. What does that tell you? It certainly didn't bother them last week when Senator Turning Your Guns, Mr. and Mrs. America, Dianne Feinstein, released the Senate transcripts of Glenn Homer Simpson of Confusion GPS. But, they, but, uh, they, but the Democrats in the House Committee, uh, Intel Committee, didn't want to see the transcript from the interview he did with them. I don't blame them. Justin Caruso, the newest documents from the IG have left Republican lawmakers stunned by what they have read. Shocking and explosive were the words used to describe their reaction. And this is in regards to the abuse of the FISA system, the FISA court, the surveillance, and everything else and they expect that it will be released to the public by the end of February. So we're probably going to get to read these transcripts and it sounds like it's going to be mind-blowing. It won't surprise any of us here that watch Towergate videos or for myself that I do these Towergate videos because we're even farther down the road than they are. We've known some of this stuff for quite some time. David Kramer Senator Magoo's right-hand man was forced to stand for deposition in the Florida BuzzFeed lawsuit in that case. Now his lawyers are asking the judge to block the release of his deposition because his attorney says it would jeopardize his personal safety, make him subject to hounding from the press, and conflict with the investigation into the dossier. Now, if you remember what happened, Gubrev's attorneys wanted to uh, depose Kramer. He tried and tried and tried to avoid it, but the judge ruled, no, Mr. Kramer, you have to schedule a deposition and you have to be deposed. At the same time, uh, Mr. Gubrev's attorneys had also uh, wanted to get several other people and uh, interview them and things and such that this was all going on. And there was a ruling in the case. And during that ruling, the attorneys for Mr. Gubarev told the judge that they no longer really cared about certain witnesses and even things regarding Mr. Kramer because apparently after they had done their deposition of Mr. Kramer, they say they now know who leaked the dossier to BuzzFeed. This leads everyone to believe about 99% sure that it was uh, Mr. Kramer, Senator Magoo's right-hand man, David Kramer, that actually gave that dossier to BuzzFeed. Now, why would Mr. Kramer have to fear for his personal safety? Hmm. Because of what he said in his deposition. What do you think he said in his deposition that would cause people to want to cause him harm? What would he have said in his deposition that would make him someone that the press would want, would want to hound in order to get interviews or information from him? What did he say in that deposition? Now, the depositions and all that stuff, a lot of that has not been released and it won't be until after the civil suit. Sometimes the attorneys can put out briefs, and we've been had access to some of the briefs, but we generally don't get the entire transcripts of the depositions, only like briefs. So we'll keep watching that, but uh, it looks more and more like David Kramer, Senator Magoo's right-hand man, was the guy who leaked the dossier to BuzzFeed, and this probably is uh, just backs that up. Clearly, there was something he said in his deposition, which he thinks is going to bring him a lot of problems. Glenn Homer Simpson of Confusion GPS has now been busted by Chuck Ross. 
of the Daily Caller. He's looked over these transcripts and he's now gone back and he's noticed that Homer Simpson of Confusion GPS told the Senate investigation that he met with Bill Browder in 2009. Later, during the House Intelligence Committee hearings, closed session, he told them that he never met Browder. And then he changed his mind and said that he did meet him back when he was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. He seems to be quite conflicted on what the truth is. And that's what happens when you lie all the time. You forget the lies that you told. It gets pretty hard to cover up the previous lies because you can't remember what you said. And this is why they call people back and, 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 and interview them multiple times. It's why they're looking into the court filings in both the court case in the UK and in the BuzzFeed case in Florida and they're looking at each other's testimonies because Glenn Simpson has now had to go on record with four or five different uh, depositions depending on what the situation is to try to determine what's the best position to take to cover his butt. And he's still got three more uh, depositions to go. He's, he's going to be deposed in the case with the uh, three oligarchs from Alpha Bank. He's going to be deposed in the Carter Page uh, uh, lawsuit. He's going to be deposed in Michael Cohen's lawsuit. With Glenn Simpson giving so many depositions and testimonies, he's bound to get crossed up with all the lies he's telling, which is exactly why you do it. Matt Gates has told Sean Hannity that not only will people in the FBI and DOJ be fired, but they will go to jail based on the evidence, which is exactly what I've been saying. And this again goes back to this FISA abuse memo. This memo, and keep in mind, the memo is just a sort of, you know, it's a memo. It's not the exact notes from everything that Nunes and his committee and his investigators have looked at. It's sort of a summation of the facts. You know, so it's not like we're going to see transcripts that's classified information. But what we are going to get, and this, in fact, this memo, this FISA abuse memo is also classified, but what they're looking to do is to declassify it and then release it sometime around the end of February is what they're hoping for. So this is what we're talking about is this FISA abuse memo that's got everyone so rattled. Gates also says that after the memos are released, that Bruce Orr and Rod Rodenstein will be fired. Sarah Carter says that her sources are telling her that the memos are so damning that it will end the Mueller investigation. Oh, here you go. The American Center for Law and Justice, Jay Sekulow, also one of the president's attorneys, is really pissed. He filed a lawsuit against the DOJ and the FBI to get the memos regarding the Clinton-Lynch tarmac meeting. If you remember, we covered here on Towergate back quite a few months ago, actually, when they discovered that there were memos about the Comey-Lynch meeting. And what was so astonishing about what we learned about that was not that the FBI and the DOJ were concerned about the fact that Clinton and Lynch had this meeting on the tarmac, but what most concerned them was some body in law enforcement or a security person who was the one responsible for leaking the story to that journalist at the airport. They were, they were saying, we got to find this guy. We got to track him down. We got to show him what's up. We got to let him know to shut up. We got to shut this guy down. That's all they were worried about was finding out who was the source, who this cop or security guy was or policeman or whoever he was that provided the information to that journalist. That was all they were talking about. That's all they were worried about. They had no problem whatsoever with, uh, the Clint, uh, with the Clinton lynch meeting on the plane. And then once they got past that, there was further evidence that there may have been discussion on how to quiet it down, how to, how to cover it up. Because remember, they were tipped off by someone at the TV station who called into the Department of Justice and said, hey, one of our reporters just discovered this little meeting down on the tarmac here. 
and they're going to go live and do a story on it. Just so you know, I'm giving you a heads up. And that's what caused officials at the FBI and DOJ to begin communicating amongst, amongst once another uh, with each other to try to determine how to handle this revelation. And so Jay Sekulow of the ACLJ decided to do a, a, a um, request to get those documents. He wasn't able to get them, so he went to court. And they ruled that the FBI and the DOJ had to turn over these notes. And now Sekulow is very, very upset because now he's being told by the DOJ and the FBI that they cannot find the Lynch-Clinton-Tarmac meeting notes. Apparently there was a glitch in the system and they've disappeared. Can't find them. Poof. Gone. No Clinton-Lynch-Tarmac meeting notes. They've disappeared. Sorry. We'll see how that goes over. Something tells me there'll be <laughs> something more to come on that. Josh Kaplan of the Gateway Pundit. The FBI is investigating millions of dollars that were funneled to the Clinton Foundation from Australian taxpayers. $88 million worth. And there's a list of names who, would, who are involved. And they're working with the Australian police to try to discover exactly what was done here because it looks mighty shady the way it was done. Not so much that it was done, it's how it was done and who the people were who were, who were involved. And there's seven or eight people who are mentioned who are now being investigated in a joint investigation between the FBI and Australian investigators. And one of the names, of course, is the, uh, the woman who was the president of, uh, of Australia at the time. I forget her name. She was batshit crazy, uh, batshit crazy liberal. But one of the names that's also mentioned is, you ready for this one? Alexander Downer. That's right, Alexander Downer, the Australian diplomat, who allegedly is the one who uh, informed the American government about Papagalopoulos. He's the guy, the Australian diplomat, that supposedly had the drunken conversation with Papagalopoulos in that bar in the UK. And now his name has popped up in this investigation between American and Australian authorities to try to find out about the shady uh, plot that uh, was being run, which resulted in the transfer of $88 million uh, of taxpayer money, Australian taxpayer money, and what they got in return, what the, what the um, Clinton Foundation did for them, or what Hillary Clinton did for them uh, as Secretary of State, they're not disclosing. But it sounds like another pay-for-play scam. One of many of the Clinton Foundation is now being unfurled. Another onion, which will need to be peeled back layer by layer. Do you have tears in your eyes? My goodness. There are a group of Republicans now pushing very, very hard to have Clapper uh, unwittingly Clapper, James Clapper, to be indicted for lying under oath. Now, that statement he made where he was asked by Senator Wyden if the NSA collects data on millions of Americans, and he said, not wittingly. Well, he lied, of course. And so now there's group, uh, a group of Republicans who are pushing the DOJ to uh, indict him for lying under oath. They have until March the 12th, because that will be the five years when the statute of limitations would be up. Now, what has happened here is that they indicted Papagalopoulos, and Mueller apparently is on a witch hunt looking for anyone that he can trick into making false statements. So now, certain members of the of, uh, Republicans, actually, it's Republicans, certain Republican members are 
now looking at all the various uh, false and misleading statements that were made to the FBI by other individuals who have not yet been charged with lying to the FBI, such as James Clapper. And also, let's not forget Huma Abedin and Cheryl Mills, who both stated they didn't know about the private server, when in fact we have the WikiLeaks emails proving that they did know. 100%. We had James Comey, who under oath lied three times perjured himself three times in his testimony, and he also admitted to passing classified information to his friend, the professor at Columbia University, with the very intent that he would leak it to the press, which would then force a special prosecutor. There we go. Now, yesterday I talked a little bit about the uh, government shutdown. I told you it was all a farce which it is, it's a political, you know, it's political theater. But at this hour, as I'm recording this video, the House, just like I told you, they have the votes, the Republican, Republicans have the votes, push the DACA bill out of there, just vote on a continuing resolution for the budget for the next 30 days so they can fight it out all over again in a month, that they would be able to do that, and then it would go to the Senate. Now in the Senate, there's a big problem because they're going to need eight Democrats to continue the budget resolution. Eight Democrats. You do not want to be Chucky e. Schumer and you do not want to be one of those eight Democrats that may have to walk the plank. Because as I told you, they painted themselves into a corner. Horrible politics. Bad politics painted themselves into a corner because now they're going to do one of two things. They're either A, going to please their base and hold the line and say we're not going to do it unless DACA is part of it. We're not going to sign off on it, in which case the government shuts down. Which doesn't really mean a whole lot, but the politics of it are huge. And it will backfire horribly against the Democrats, and they know it. But on the other hand, if they find eight Democrats to walk the plank and vote for it, because they don't want to suffer the political consequences they know will come, who will those eight Democrats be? And will Chucky e. Schumer come out and assault them or thank them? It's a tough play for him, and it's a tough play for eight Democrats, probably the lower-ranking ones. Now, these are not House members. These are senators. Totally different ballgame. Will eight Democrats be forced to walk the plank to save the neck of Chuck Schumer and the Democratic Party from the massive blowback that's going to happen if they do not find a Democrats to pass the bill to continue funding the government? Or will they block it, let the government have the shutdown, in which case, yes, they win with their base, but they lose with the general populace. And overall, it's a big lose for the Democrats. There's no way for them to win because they backed themselves, painted themselves into a corner that they just really can't get out of. And uh, it's just bad political maneuvering is all it is. And the fact is the Republicans simply outmaneuvered them on this particular uh, thing. And this is, you know, we saw this happen two weeks before Christmas. If the Democrats wanted to play that card, they could have played it in, in December. They're holding the exact same card now. The difference is Back then, they did not paint themselves into the corner. This time they did. So they ought to do one of the two things. Either sign on to this budget resolution and have their entire left wing of their base hate them and be even more angry with them, or they sign on to it and they pay a heavy, heavy political price for being the cause of the government shutdown, which their friends on the left have blown up and turned into a major crisis. And there's no way they can spin it back on the Republicans. And the Republicans have the best argument back at them that you can have. <laughs> Which is that, yeah, they would sacrifice uh, taking care of our military in exchange for uh, playing into the favor of 800,000 people who are here illegally. Who do they support? The military or 800,000 people who are here illegally? That's how it's going to look. That's how it's going to play out. You do not want to be Chucky e. Schumer or one of those eight Democrats who may have to walk the plank. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's Towergate video. I'll be back tomorrow and we're going to dig in to the Uranium One uh, crisis. There'll be other things coming up on the dossier and things. We'll cover that as well. But uh, also uh, something major breaking on the uh, Imran Awan case that we'll talk about tomorrow as well. So I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. We'll talk about it then. You guys have a good night. Goodbye.